Thank you. So I want to talk to you today about your plans. You're smart, curious, goal-oriented people, right? Otherwise, why would you be here? You make plans, you set goals, you achieve milestones and measure results. Planning, that makes for you a success, right? Well, perhaps. We are taught to set goals, make plans, measure twice, cut once, best practices, right? And I'll have to admit that planning is really necessary for certain mission-critical things like rocket ships, skyscrapers, nuclear power plants, things that are really complicated, risky, things where failure is just not an option, like this speech, for instance. I outlined it, I wrote it, I rehearsed it, I memorized it, because I am very intimidated by smart, curious, goal-oriented people. Well, five years ago, well, let me say that um, regarding planning, the point here that I want to make is that for the things that you really, really care about, I think you should throw out the plan. And not because a plan couldn't help you reach your goal, but because that goal would be too small, too limiting, because that goal might not be what you ultimately want or need. So five years ago, I, did, I thought I needed a plan. Uh, after 30 years as the CEO of an advertising agency in Akron, I sold the company. And my wife and I were ready for the next chapter in our lives. Uh, we, Laura, and I, Laura and I have been collecting contemporary art ever since we were married. And so we thought that might be the right beginning for a plan. A plan for a private museum a place to show and share our collection with a select audience of people, uh, a place to hang out, a pet a terre, a kind of ur urban arty clubhouse. Well, maybe this was really more of an idea at first than a plan, because we really didn't know of anyone who'd ever done anything like this. But with the confidence of the clueless, we set out to acquire a building in exactly the wrong way. Our brief to our realtor was something like, well, we don't know what we want, but we'll know it when we see it. And we didn't see it for quite a while, until we did, on the corner of West 29th and Church Street in an out-of-the-way corner of Ohio City. It's an um, electrical station, a substation to power the trolley lines that went down Detroit, built in the 20s. It was too small, it needed a lot of work, and it wasn't for sale. Otherwise, it was perfect. <laughs> it was a, like a little temple to industry with beautiful decorative brickwork, high ceilings, an overhead crane that could lift 15 tons. We didn't know what we were going to do with that, but we wanted it. <laughs> and our... Um, and finally, we were actually able to persuade the owner to sell. Uh, and um, working with our architect, John Williams, uh, we designed this beautiful place. Uh, and, you know, it was looking like, well, we had a plan. Until the whole project took a U-turn, uh, David Franklin, then the director of the Cleveland Museum of Art, caught wind of our plan and asked us if we would reconsider the whole thing. Could we collaborate with the Cleveland Museum of Art? Could this be a public project? Could it be built to museum standards? Could it be open to the public free five days a week for exhibitions, programs, concerts? In other words, could we kill the cute private apartment, kill the private gallery, kill the whole private thing, and start again from scratch? Well, of course we said yes. And we did completely redesign the whole project. We surrendered half our exhibition schedule to the Cleveland Museum of Art. 
and we even promised to give the whole facility to the museum in 15 years. Great negotiating skills, right? <laughs> it wasn't until a bit later that Laura and I really realized exactly what we had given up. Uh, we'd given up um, our dream, our project, our plan no longer belonged to us. We'd given up our privacy, we'd given up control, and we'd taken on a lot of responsibility. This wasn't our private plaything anymore, this was a commitment to our partner and to the public. And it stopped feeling like the freedom of a retirement plan and more like the obligations of a full-time job that you had to pay for to keep. <laughs> then came the surprises. We discovered the neighborhood. You see, Laura and I are from Akron. We really didn't know that much about Cleveland, much less Ohio City. And it never occurred to us to visit the place after dark until after we had done the deal. <laughs> that was a big mistake. The corner of West 29th and Church Street did seem quiet by day, but after night, uh, after sunset, it was a sketchy place place for prostitution, drug use, breaking and entering, a place where you didn't always feel safe. But now that we were launching a public institution, it's not like we could just barricade ourselves in. We were responsible for making the neighborhood better now, and we couldn't do it alone. So not only had we surrendered control of our project to others, now we actually had to work with others to achieve a goal that was really very different, a goal that was about a sort of community change, economic development, not about art and culture. Well, nevertheless, we did open Transformer Station to the public in February of 2013. And although Laura and I had no experience running a museum, mounting exhibitions, serving the public, after a couple of months, we felt like we were faking it pretty well. Then another surprise. In October of 2013, David Franklin suddenly left the Cleveland Museum of Art. And the board of directors asked me to assume the duty of interim director and CEO of an institution with 350 employees, 45,000 priceless objects of art, and a couple of really big problems. All for the annual salary of one US dollar. Well, if Laura and I knew nothing about running the Transformer Station, I can tell you I totally knew nothing about running the Cleveland Museum of Art. Just one of the world's most important arts institutions. No pressure. Well, when we opened Transformer Station, Laura created a special limited edition art object to commemorate the event. It's a switch. <laughs> it's, a <laughs> it's a switch with two settings, goddamn genius and fucking idiot. <laughs> she made it to memorialize our folly, but also to recognize that whatever we were going to do, we were going to do big. And whenever you do things big, there are only two outcomes, big success and big failure. And I'll have to tell you, at this point in our journey, it was feeling like the genius switch was stuck on idiot for most of the time. Well, I'm happy to report three years later that the Transformer Station is a cultural and a community success. <laughs> Safe, diverse, and family friendly. The, our front yard looks and acts like a public park. Uh, Thousands of people come from all around the city to shop at the fascinating stores along West 29th Street, and a lot of them are staying to uh, uh, live in the neighborhood uh, in one of the hundreds of new housing units that's going up all around us. 
In fact, Laura and I are moving to the neighborhood. We bought the Van Roy Coffee Building one block north of a Transformer Station, and we're outfitting the top floor and the roof as our private residence. But I'm really proud to say that we're also making it possible for Spaces Gallery, the legendary nonprofit lab for artist experimentation, to move into the first floor. And what a marvelous neighbor they're going to be for Transformer Station. And we're bringing new jobs to the neighborhood. Uh, a marketing or software firm will be moving in to the second floor as a tenant. I'm also happy to report that I have turned over the keys to the Cleveland Museum of Art, relatively unscathed, to Bill Griswold, uh, our brilliant new director, uh, who actually does know what he's doing. And in fact, the Cleveland Museum of Art is thriving as never before, and I got a priceless education in arts administration. Well, our failure to plan did create some surprises, some accidents, but it also uncovered some opportunities. And those opportunities then suggested some bigger ideas, like this one. Front International Cleveland Exhibition for Contemporary Art. It is a very ambitious European-style, multi-month, multi-venue exhibition of the world's most leading-edge contemporary art that will launch in the summer of 2018 in Cleveland. Uh, with the objective of bringing the world to see the amazing arts and culture resources we have here in Cleveland. So, <laughs> genius, idiot, ask me in 2019. Well, five years ago, I never would have thought that I would have arrived at this point. Instead of a retired art collector, it seems I've become a serial entrepreneur with a goal of improving the community through arts and culture. So what does this all have to do with planning? Well, exactly nothing. I didn't have a plan. In fact, if I had made a plan, none of this would have happened. That plan would have been too small. With a plan, I never would have surrendered control. With a plan, I never would have collaborated with all the amazing people who've made these projects, this life, bigger than I'd ever imagined. Yeah, I didn't have a plan, but I did have a passion for art. As a matter of fact, artists don't make plans either, right? Their discovery, their inspiration comes through the creative process. So my advice to you, scrap your plans and follow your passions. Thank you.